afternoon class. So for today, we're going to learn about the higher functions of the nervous system. Again, I'm Dr. Anna Angelica Makalalad Hosme and I'll be your professor for today. So for this session, our learning objectives are as follows. So at the end of this session, the students should be able to, number one, distinguish the function of the different lobes of the cerebral cortex. So I'm sure this has been discussed with you with neuroanatomy. So this will just be a very short review. So next, we're going to learn an overview of the electroencephalogram. Next, we're going to, I hope you guys will be able to understand the sleep-wake cycle, to learn how cerebral dominance and language works, and to comprehend the concept of learning and memory. So this is an illustration of your cerebral cortex. So this is just a review. So this is a lateral, um, wait, let me, uh, yeah. I hope you can see my arrow. So this is the lateral view of your brain and this is the medial view of your brain. So in the lateral view, you'll be able to see the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and then the temporal lobe, and then the orbital lobe. So from this view, you have your frontal lobe, and then your parietal lobe, your orbital, um, occipital lobe, and your temporal lobe over here. So, and then you have your corpus callosum, this one, you know, that connects the um, left and right hemispheres. No? It's an interconnection to the cerebral commissure that coordinates the activities between the two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex. So your right and left hemisphere, as you will learn later, would have different functions as well, even if it's in the same location. So the, the central sulcus um, separates your frontal and your parietal sulcus, while your lateral sulcus um, separates your temporal and your frontal um, so, uh, frontal and temporal lobes. Well, your parieto occipital fissure here separates your occipital lobe and your um, frontal, uh, parietal lobe. And that's your corpus callosum. So, um, what are the different functions of the different lobes of the cerebral cortex? So first, your frontal lobe here no, is in charge of your motor behavior. So you have your pre-motor pre, uh, cortex, um, which is involved in the planning of your movement. So for example, you're about to walk down the stairs. So before you walk down the stairs, your brain will plan it. And when you execute your um, movement, it's also the pre-motor cortex that is in charge of that. So both planning and execution is part of your of any movement is a function of your frontal lobe. Aside from that, speech generation, which is in the Broca's area, is also located in your frontal lobe. So Broca means um, creation of vocal speech. No? So that's how I try to remember it when I was a student. So, broca, vocal. No? It's the area of the brain where speech is generated. In the prefrontal cortex, this one here in this area, um, it has a major role in personality and emotional behavior. So, if you have any lesions in this area, you would exhibit changes in behavior and personality. So for example, a patient develops a stroke, no? and then the person be becomes uh, very irritable, uh, very um, combative. No? Usually the, the area that is affected is the frontal lobe, particularly the prefrontal cortex. So later on, I'll show you what happens if you remove that area of the brain. So if there are any lesions in the frontal cortex, no, patients will exhibit attention deficit, difficulty in planning and problem solving. Remember the premotor cortex 
is also in uh, there, no? inappropriate social behavior and reduced aggressive behavior. So um, I have a video on um, patients that exhibit frontal lobe, um, exhibits changes in behavior before and after frontal lobotomy. I'll also post the link in the down below on this video, but I'll show this to you briefly, just for a moment. So in the past, patients with psychiatric disorders were treated with surgery. And like now, we usually use very um, effective psychiatric drugs in treating psychiatric disorders. So this patient, let's go back a little while, is a male patient, 22-year-old male that has been ill for five years, um, has undergone shock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy and was not responsive. So patient would present with this. Rigidity. Sorry. Okay, as you can see, it's not very, um, it's not conversant, it's not, um, he has a blunt affect, no? After the surgery, no? They noted that he became more pleasant, more cooperative. Let's see what happens. He's waving. I don't know what they're doing right now. Let's move forward. It's more cooperative, no? follows commands. Follows instructions. Okay. Two months post-operative entering activities readily. Affable, very friendly, capable of making adjustment outside of the hospital. So now she can play cards already. Okay, this was in the past, of course. Right now, because we have a lot of newer um, antipsychotic or psychiatric meds, frontal lobotomy has largely fallen out of favor already. No, so probably in very, 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 very refractory cases. And this is um, um, not highly recommended anymore because of long-term um, complications. See the difference from the first time before the surgery and now a few months after the surgery, okay? So I'll let you watch the rest of the clip. I'll post the link down below so that you can watch the rest of the video. So next we go to your parietal lobe. So your parietal lobe, if the frontal lobe is in charge of movement, your parietal lobe is in charge of receiving sensation, receiving sensory information. So for example, you touch, you touch a hot surface, no? it will be processed by your parietal lobe cortex or your somatosensory cortex and the parietal association cortex. So it processes how you perceive sensory information. So if you touch a hot object, it your 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 um sensory parietal lobe cortex will sense it as something hot. Or if you touch a um a cold surface or a furry object it will be perceived or sensed by your parietal cortex and it's your parietal cortex that will tell you that this surface is furry or soft, 
No? And your parietal lobe is also important in determining spatial context. So, for example, you're trying to solve puzzles. Um, it's the parietal lobe that's working. Okay? Your occipital lobe is important for visual processing and perception. And it also controls or affects eye movements. So, it assists in the control of convergent eye movements, pupillary constriction, and accommodation. So, remember in your um, um, visual pathway, you know, the occipital lobe is that part of the brain that is part of that pathway. Okay? The temporal lobe has many functions. So, number one is hearing. So, if you hear a sound, it gets it gets transmitted into your middle ear and then later or into your inner ear to your cochlear nerve and then it gets processed into your temporal lobe and it's your temporal lobe that perceives let's see the music or the loud sound no? and then um, another thing is the processing of your vestibular information also through your ears um, next is higher order Visual processing, like recognition of faces, um, recognition of objects. No? Limbic system is also located in your temporal lobe. And um, limbic system is involved in creation of emotions, no? emotional behavior. They say that the feeling of being in love is not really coming from the heart, but actually coming from the limbic system because it's that part of your brain that um creates emotions or creates feelings of emotions and this is also related to the regulation of the autonomic nervous system so the temporal lobe also contains your hippocampus no, or your hippocampal formation and this is where learning and memory um happens no so if you have any lesion in your hippocampus then you can have difficulty forming new memories or retrieving old memories as well as learning new things so next we go to the electroencephalogram so the eeg is an important diagnostic tool in clinical neurology especially in patients with epilepsy so if the heart has an ecg or an electrocardiogram in the brain it's your electroencephalogram so this is a picture of a child where they place multiple electrodes on the different um, uh, um, that corresponds to different portions in your brain so that it can detect the electrical activity. So you, you, the, the waves are generated um, by, by the alternating excitatory and inhibitory synaptic potentials here in the parabenal cells of the cerebral cortex. So this this um, alternating potentials is detected by your EEG electrode and this is amplified by your EEG machine and it is recorded like this no? like an ECG but less regular so these are your the different areas of the brain and these are your waves so this is um, EEG demonstrating polyspike and wave discharges seen in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So you see in this um, section, there are disordered waves no? that corresponds to um, the epileptiform activity in the brain. So your EEG, much like your ECG, also has different kinds of waves depending on the level of brain activity. So if you're awake with mental activity, like what I'm doing right now and your eyes are open, your EEG would show beta waves like this. When you're awake and resting with your eyes closed, then your brain will now produce alpha waves and it will look in your EEG as slower waves like this. If you start sleeping, your waves will now become fatal peaks and it will become even more slower. And in your, when you are now in deep sleep, um, you will now have delta waves and these are slow waves. No? And this will, this 
your body will feel relaxed, the muscles are relaxed, the heart rate will slow down, the pressure will also start going down. No? So when you're in the ICU, when patients are in deep sleep, you will be able to mm-hmm. observe that some of them would have very low heart rates, no? as low as like 51, 52, you know? And then when you wake them up, no, the heart rate will start going back. So next, we'll go to discuss the sleep-wake cycle. This is also a higher function of the brain. So the sleep-wake cycle is related to your circadian rhythm. So we have lots of biological rhythms. So I think in the endocrine system, if this gets discussed. Um, so for example, we have the... Uh, menstrual cycle, 28-day cycle, or the, the different cycles of the hormones also functions in a circadian rhythm. So in a circadian rhythm usually is a cycle of one day per day city. So normally the sleep-wake cycle is entrained as a circadian rhythm and it's entrained to the day-night cycle. So how you perceive night and day. So, for example, if it's sunlight, you know the body perceives it as daytime. And when it's dark outside, so when it's dark outside, um, you know that it's nighttime already. So, it gets entrained into your sleep-wake cycle. So, that's why in patients with, um, with a reverse cycle, let's say graveyard shift workers, you no. Know, who's usually awake at night and asleep in the morning, their sleep-wake cycle is disrupted or disturbed. Or in countries where, um, let's say in Scandinavian countries when, where they would have days that would be long or very short, no? that also affects your sleep-wake cycle. No? I remember when I visited Australia, I was so surprised that it was 9 p.m. in the evening, but it was still daylight outside. So it kind of um, disoriented me no? because I'm not used to um, having that kind of um, sleep-wake cycle. So this a sleep-wake cycle, this circadian rhythm, is entrained or detected by your suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. So it's your hypothalamus that regulates this sleep-wake cycle, no? which receives inputs from the retina. So when your eyes perceive that it's daytime, no, it gets processed by the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, and this now sets your sleep-wake cycle. Now, if you're not sleeping all the time, your sleep is disrupted, no? Um this gets this is perceived or detected by your suprachiasmatic nucleus and it creates a lot of um different problems in your body because remember your hypothalamus is connected to your hypothalamic pituitary endocrine axis na? remember that so this when so as part of the sleep wake cycle we also need to talk about sleep no so sleep has several stages you have stage one stage two stage three stage four stage five so it depends no in stage one no this is about four to five percent of your entire sleep cycle or your sleep mm-hmm. duration so usually when you're just about to sleep the sleep is just light no your muscle activity starts to slow down some of you might notice some muscle twitching and then later on, when your sleep goes deeper down, no, you go transition into stage two. This is about 45 to 55 percent of the time you're sleeping. Your breathing pattern, your heart rate slows down. There is a slight decrease in body temperature. And then you go to stage three of sleep, and this is where deep sleep begins. This is just a small portion of your entire sleep duration. And this is the period where your brain begins to generate slow delta waves. Remember the the waves that are very slow and big. And then later on in your stage four, this is now very deep sleep. You will have different breathing, limited muscle activity, and again, delta waves predominate. And then after that, your, your 
um, brain will now go to a stage in your sleep called the rapid eye movement stage or your stage 5 or your REM sleep. So this time, your brain waves speed up and this is where dreaming occurs. No? If you have a dream, this is when your body is very relaxed, but your heart rate increases and breathing may be rapid and shallow. No? It's the opposite of your deep sleep where your breathing and your heart rate slows down. Okay, so you can have several cycles of this no, in a night. Okay, so your REM sleep, as I mentioned earlier, is rapid eye movement sleep that occurs every 90 minutes when you go to sleep. The EEG resembles that of a person who is awake or in stage 1 or non REM sleep. So the waves are like beta waves. So this is where dreams occur. There is rapid eye movement if you observe their eyes. There is loss of muscle tone. There's pupillary constriction. They could, they could also have female erection. And um, the use of benzodiazepines and increasing age decrease the duration of REM sleep. That's why patients who are on benzodiazepines, diazepines like your diazepam, your midazolam, they have very, very deep sleep. No? Next, we go to cerebral dominance. So some people can have um, a left hemisphere dominant no? or a right hemisphere dominant. So, but most of the time, people would be left hemisphere dominant. Most of us no? will have left hemisphere dominant. And the left hemisphere is dominant for language, math, logic, problem solving, asking questions about the world, making connections. No? Um, so each hemisphere of the brain is dominant for specific behavior. So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, even if it's the same location in the right and left hemisphere, they work differently still. So the right hemisphere, on the other hand, is dominant for spatial abilities like piecing together a puzzle, arranging blocks, to, make, to match designs, um, reading maps, face recognition, interpreting gesture, visual imagery, music. No? Some people say that people who have a dominant right hemisphere are those that are very, very creative, no? like musicians, artists. No? So, as I mentioned earlier, this left cerebral hemisphere is a dominant hemisphere for language in over 90% of both right-handed and left-handed people. No? So in your left hemisphere, no, usually these are the things that, that um, facilitates um, Writing, no? hearing, understanding language, how to do math, no? vision. No? However, on the other side, on the right hemisphere, usually this is the one that's in charge in music, no? creating art, recognizing shapes, no? doing puzzles. No? Okay? So... The language center comes from the left hemisphere. So your Broca's area and your Wernicke's area is in the left hemisphere. So people who have stroke you know, on the right side of the body usually have the left side of the brain that is affected. So sometimes when the right side of the body is affected or gets a stroke, you no. Know, the left side of the brain gets a stroke. Usually, they can talk. These people who have the stroke affecting the left hemisphere. So, the Broca's area is where speech is produced, while the Wernicke's area is where you understand speech or your speech comprehension. So, it's located in your temporal lobe. So, if there are any lesions in the left hemisphere, patients develop aphasia either an inability to speak or write. 
So these patients would present with either unable to produce speech or unable to understand speech. So if the Wernix area is affected, they would patients would have receptive aphasia or fluent aphasia. They can speak, but they cannot understand spoken or written language. If the patient has Broca's aphasia, so the lesion or a lesion affecting the Broca's area, they have expressive aphasia. They cannot talk, but they can understand it. They can follow commands, but they cannot answer fluently. Okay? So this is an example. So if a patient has Wernix aphasia, the, uh, a conversation with an examiner might look like this. You know? Their brain would say, I want an apple, but... Uh, so tell me the names of each of these. The patient, this is a cigarette. Okay? But... Uh, if they are presented with a comb, they would say another, another, they can, they can verbalize, but they cannot really identify. Now, like for example, presented with a match, but they would say it's a cigarette, no? Presented with a pen, but they would say it's a line or a toothbrush, they would say it's a rock stream, no? They can, they can try to verbalize, but they cannot really name the object. In Broca's aphasia, no, they can they can understand the question, but they have difficulty answering because they have difficulty producing the words. No? So for example, this is an actual story of a patient with um, Broca's aphasia. So the examiner asked the patient, were you in the Coast Guard? Um, the patient said, no, you're just ma 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 Massachusetts Coast Guard years. Oh, you were in the Coast Guard for years. The patient would say, oh boy, right, instead of saying yes, no? The, the patient would, the examiner would say, why are you in the hospital? The patient, instead of saying complete sentences or phrases, he would point to the paralyzed arm, arm no good. No? So, in essence, the patient can understand the examiner, but he, he, does, he just cannot verbalize it very well because of the broadcast application. Next, we go to learning and memory. So in learning is a neural mechanism by which the individual changes behavior as the result of experience. So we learn from our experience. No? Memory, on the other hand, is a storage mechanism from what is learned. So there are several ways on how we facilitate learning and memory. So one is, um, one aspect of learning and memory is habituation. We get habituated or we get used to something. So this is learning not to respond to repetitions of an insignificant stimulus, not the ability to ignore irrelevant and repetitive stimuli. So for example, in this comic strip, you know, at the beginning, this, this is a cat or a mouse. I think this is a cat, no? So first, uh, a noisy truck you know, comes in and he gets scared. You know? But the second truck comes in and he learns that it's really nothing. You know? He's starting to grow on me. So even if there's, and the next time, the long, the more machines, the more trucks come in, he's not bothered anymore. I'm no longer bothered by the machine. It's just like us. You know? For example, you're in the classroom and you hear a lot of buses and cars driving by. At the beginning, you can get distracted, but once you get used to, to cars and buses passing through the window, you know, you get accustomed to it. You don't, you no longer get bothered by it because you're able to be habituated to it, no? because it now becomes an insignificant stimulus. Next aspect of learning and memory is sensitization. This time, Instead of being habituated, you get more sensitized, you increase you know, your responsiveness to an innocuous or a painless stimuli, a painful stimuli that follow the presentation of a strong or a noxious stimulus. So for example, you know, this is an example. Um, for example, you, this, this, this mouse is injected, let's say, with cocaine. So his initial response is 
it's just cool about it. And then he gets um, given another injection, then it, he gets had an increased response and then another and then he becomes crazy. Okay, so that's sensitization. You get more sensitive to a stimuli. Next aspect of learning is associative conditioning. So this is learning to respond to a previously insignificant event after it has been paired with a significant one. So for example, um, if you see other people, it doesn't mean anything to you. But if you see another, let's say this person sees this cat, no? I feel dancing every time I see you because he associates this cat to an event where probably they were dancing. No? So this is associative conditioning. So this associated associative conditioning, I I used to use this when I was studying, even now. No? So for example, um, I want to learn about Cushing syndrome. So I try to remember an actual patient that I saw in the clinic with Cushing syndrome. And whenever I see one, you know, I will never forget what the Cushing syndrome person or patient looks like. You know? so, so that every time I see another patient with Cushing syndrome, with this constellation of signs and symptoms, I will remember this Cushing syndrome because I associated with another patient from the past. Okay, so that's associative conditioning. Okay, so you can take advantage of that when you study for school. So last, we go to memory. I think this is the last, the second to the last. No? So your memory is a function of your temporal lobe. So if you decide that you have to remember something, for example, when studying for a test, the brain makes connections between the cells which alters their structure and it and is what allows us to retain memories. Mm -hmm. And one of the famous story about Einstein is how, how his brain was, when they autopsied his brain, his brain had many, many, um, what do you call that? Convolutions, no? In his cerebral cortex, because probably because of his increased brain activity, it altered the brain structure. That's why it looks different from the usual brain. And that's the alteration of the structure allows us to retain memories or to learn and bank this new learning in our brain. So there are two kinds of memories your long term memory and your short term memory. So in the long-term memory, um, these are events, facts, or experiences that were laid down weeks, months, or even years ago. For example, your birthday, your mom's birthday, or your um, memories from high school, no, your first girlfriend. No? Um, this is categorized as long-term memory. There is also an intermediate form that this can be disrupted, and there's also a long lasting form which is difficult to disrupt or difficult to forget. So, for example, I don't think you'll be able to forget your birthday or your mom's name, no? So, or the street where you grow you grew up in. No? These are long lasting memories that are difficult to forget. Um, short term memory, no? That's where. That an example of that would be when you have an exam in biochemistry and you try to memorize all the enzymes in glycolysis and then immediately after the exam, you forget about it. No? That's short-term memory. The short-term memory is related to recent events. Usually, it persists only for only a few minutes. No? Let's say, example, you remember a telephone number after calling the operator. Or as I mentioned earlier, remembering, let's say, the enzymes of glycolysis, or remembering the fasting blood sugar of your patient this morning. Those are um, short-term memories. So with long-term memory, this involves structural changes in the nervous system because this form of memory can remain intact even after events that disrupt short-term memory. So if you have bilateral removal of the hippocampal formation, 
this severely and permanently disrupts basic memory. Remember that the hippocampal formation is crucial in memory. So short-term and long-term memories are unaffected before the removal of the height that have been formed prior to the removal of the hippocampal formation. But new long-term memories can no longer be stored because there's no longer a hippocampal formation. No? Remember the 51st states? No? Every time she wakes up, she forgets everything that happened the day before. No, she has to form it. It's sort of like related to that. No? Lastly is neural plasticity. No? Any neural plasticity is happens when uh, damage to the nervous system can induce remodeling of neural pathways and thereby alter behavior. So for example, this is a patient with strabismus. No? So if you patch the affected eye, it can result in changes in the brain. No? It, can change, it can result in remodeling changes in the neural pathways in the brain in order to be able to correct that um, defect or that strabismus. No? And um, usually this neural plasticity is greatest in the developing brain. So let's say you are already an adult with your strabismus, even if you do the patching, no, it may not be as effective compared to if you do it when the patient is still a kid. No? So neural plasticity can be induced by lesions such as stroke, sensory deprivation, like this one, this is sensory deprivation in experience. No? An example, as I mentioned earlier, is amblyopia or lazy eye, and this can be corrected by patching or sensory deprivation. Phantom limb is another example of neural plasticity. No? So when a person receives sensations on the missing limb when stimulated elsewhere on the body because of the interconnections from the surrounding cortical territories into the cortical region that had the amputated limb. No? So for example, your amputated limb has a connection in your parietal cortex and then um, there's sometimes you feel that it's still itchy even if the limb is no longer there because that area of the brain is stimulated by um, another connection from elsewhere. So that's your phantom limb. So some patients feel like their limb is still there or they still feel a little bit of pain there, even if the limb is no longer there. This is called the phantom limb syndrome. So how does neural plasticity works? Synaptic pruning can delete and create new connection, closely tied to the ability to learn and remember. Now each neuron acts independently, but learning new skill requires lots of neurons. No? So when you're in med school, you really need to make a lot of new neural connections in order to learn a lot of new things at a short period of time. So in summary, the cerebral cortex can be subdivided into lobes based on the pattern of the gyri and sulci. And each lobe has a distinct function as shown by the effects of lesions or seizures. The EEG varies with the state of the sleep-wake cycle, disease, and other factors. EEG rhythms include, as I showed you earlier, the alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. Sleep can be divided into slow wave, you know, the first stages of sleep, and the REM forms, which is stage five. Slow wave sleep progresses through stages one through four, each with a characteristic EEG pattern. Most dreams occur in REM sleep, and the EEG pattern is like that of an awake person. Memory, on the other hand, includes short-term, no minutes, recent, and long-term storage processes and a retrieval mechanism. Damage to the nervous system can induce remodeling of neural pathways and thereby alter behavior, um, resulting in neural plasticity. So that's the end of my lecture. So I also sent you the handout to my lecture in order to help you with your exam. So I hope you understand the... Um, the concepts that we discuss. If you have any questions, you can post them down below or post them in our MSDs. So um, thank you for listening. So just uh, good luck on your exam.